Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 say this, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. And the title of my sermon is, The Land Was Filled With Them. The land was filled with them. In this sermon, I'm going to explain to you what is wrong with this depopulation theory that we see people like politicians and other people pushing, where they basically teach on a global scale, they'll say the world is better served if there are fewer people in it. They'll say, oh, there's not enough resources. There's not enough of this or that. We need to cut down on the amount of people. And then if on a personal level, they like to say, if you have kids, you won't have a good financial life. You need to not have kids because kids will just siphon all your resources. I'm going to explain what is wrong with that and why that's a bunch of hogwash, why it's not scriptural, and why it actually can be destructive to your life. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that we as Christians are under two mandates to multiply. The first one is physical. The second one is spiritual. Genesis chapter one, verse 28. God tells mankind, be fruitful and multiply. In fact, that's why God instituted marriage in the first place. That's one of the reasons. Because the Bible says, I think it's Malachi, it's in the Minor Prophets, where God says that he might seek a godly seed. God wants Christians to get together, be married, and have children. God wants people in general to get together, be married, and have children. Now, God wants you to be saved. God wants you to marry someone that's saved. But God set up the institution of marriage from the very beginning. Jesus even repeats this where he says, In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That one flesh is talking about the couple coming together physically. That is a command of God for us to multiply physically. God told us in Genesis chapter 1 to replenish the earth. Replenish means to replace that which is lost, right? Because God looked through time and knew that sin would come into the world. He knew that people would die. He knew that his creation was going to go through some hard times. So he wanted life to continue on in spite of those things. And the commandment to be fruitful and multiply was never done away with in the New Testament. It's a standing order. That's why God commands marriage. That's why Paul said, I will that the younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house. That's something a lot of people don't want to talk about. The fact that God placed it for women to marry, bear children, and guide the house. That's an important step. And a lot of cultures where you see massive population decline, it's because of feminism. It's because the women said, I'd rather not marry, bear children, and guide the house. I'd rather have a career and sleep with whoever I want and no consequences. You get massive population decline that way. That is in a bad direction. But then the second mandate that we have to multiply, where Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, command, to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, right? So that's to multiply spiritually, to make new Christians by giving unsaved people the gospel so that they can receive it, get saved, become a Christian, and then from there, grow God's family. So that's the second way that we as Christians are commanded to multiply. And wouldn't it be great if we as Christians had children, had lots of children, which we raised to be Christian, and on top of that, we converted the lost to Christianity. Imagine how you would see Christianity explode in America, because right now it's on the decline. Right now, Christianity is such on a decline in the United States that if ever an unpopular touchy topic comes up like so the sodomites or the transgender or abortion, the Christian's like, oh, well, you know, I, I love all people. You know, I, I love you. I, I just don't agree. I love you. Rather than boldly saying, hey, that's wrong. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. So stop aborting your baby. Rather than saying the Bible says if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall surely be upon them. That's in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, that I'm basically paraphrasing there, where the Bible says that sodomy, that same-sex marriage or physical relations, is an abomination, that God opposes it. Where the Bible talks about the fact if a man puts on a woman's garment, that's an abomination as well. 
Rather than Christians being bold and denouncing that stuff, Christians are like, oh, well, well, I just love everybody, you know. Imagine if the land were filled with them. Because this, cause my sermon's called The Land Was Filled With Them, right? Because if you look in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, it says at the end that the land was filled with them. Imagine if the land were filled with Christians, were filled with strong Christians. These left-wing globalist politicians would not even have a chance of getting elected dog catcher, let alone senator, let alone congressman, or any other office that they want to hold. So the reason why we're in the state we are now is because, and I'm going to be brutally honest with you, Christians have stopped having babies. Christians have bought into the lie that says, have one and get your tubes tied. Get on the pills so you don't have any because they're a financial burden. Listen, no matter what, you're going to have to spend money on something. There's no way to just stingy your way to being rich. The Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's, I believe, Matthew chapter 25. It's either 25 or 6. I keep getting it mixed up in my head. But Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Those things are the physical possessions which you need. Because let's say you live alone and you don't have any kids. Okay, you're still going to have to pay taxes. You're still going to have to pay rent. You're still going to have to take care of all your living expenses. Plus, a lot of people who never settle into family life, they keep a bunch of unstable spending habits. Like they're always paying a lot of money on eating out or entertainment. They never learn how to be responsible with their money because they don't have someone else that's depending upon them where they have to, okay, I got to learn how to budget because my kid needs shoes. I'll, I'll have to just, I'll have to do that car repair myself. You know, rather than take it to the mechanic and spend a few hundred dollars, I'm going to watch this Chris Fix video, get under my car, figure it out myself. Great. All I had to do was buy the parts from AutoZone. But hey, now I have more knowledge how to fix a car. Now I had to budget here. I had to be more responsible. I had to actually learn how to cook so I could save money instead of going to Red Lobster all the time. No dis. I had some great memories of Red Lobster. But that's the point is learning how to be responsible with your money so you can use it for more meaningful purposes. Because guess what? When you die, you can't take your money with you. Which is why Jesus said to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth. The moth doesn't destroy it. Rust doesn't corrupt it. Store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Do things that are pleasing unto God. Now let's continue here with Exodus chapter 1 where we are. It says in verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more, watch this y'all, and mightier than we. Why were they more and mightier? Because it's not enough to just be more. They were more and they were mightier. Why? Because they were God's people. Now, I'm not saying that just because you're born an Israelite, that meant you were automatically God's people, but they had the word of God. I'm taking it from this, that a, a large majority of them were saved. They were more and mightier than the Egyptians. The Egyptians felt threatened. Don't you know, folks, your kids are your weapon against the devil? Look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127 is the verse for you bachelors out there who are afraid to settle down. You're hesitant about marriage. You don't want kids. You just want to stay with the bachelor party life. Stay up as late as you want. Spend your money on yourself. Listen to what Psalm 127 says. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. And a lot of you people there with sleep problems, you need to pray. Cast your cares upon Jesus, for he careth for you. You suffer from insomnia, work hard physically, and maybe you'll get some sleep. Pray and ask God to bless you with it. Make sure you're getting a balanced diet. Make sure you're not keeping your cell phone uh, right above your face all the time right before bed because that light will suppress melatonin production. But that's a whole other discussion. Let's continue. Watch this. This is very important. Verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. God is saying children are a blessing. 
So these Bill Gates, George Soros types who tell you your kid is a burden, have as few kids as possible, live this MGTOW lifestyle, live this independent <clears throat> woman lifestyle. The Bible says the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are a blessing from God. Let's continue here. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Children of your youth. That, does, that means not waiting until you're 40 before you decide to get married, settle down, and have kids. Now, if you didn't find the right person until you were 40, I'm not talking about you. I'm not directing this at you. I'm talking about the 20-somethings out there who don't even want to think about marriage. They're like, oh, I'll put that off until I'm 35 and making six figures. The Bible says children of the youth. Start early. Start when you're young. I'm not saying start when you're underage or anything like that. Obviously, you're an adult. You're married. You're able to provide for your children. But that's what you need to push yourself in the direction of. When I say start young, I would say early 20s is a good time to become a parent. When you're married, of course. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So your children are your weapon against the devil's ideology. Your children go on to speak with the enemy in the gate. You raise your children with the scripture. You raise your children godly. And then when they grow up and you're too old to do the same things you used to, maybe you can't knock as many doors. Maybe you don't have the energy to do as much evangelism or whatever it is that you used to do for the Lord, your children will pick up on that work. Think about the fact that God did not want David to build the temple. Solomon went on to do it. There are works that need to be done for God that are so great that you won't be able to finish in your generation and your kids need to go on and finish the work. Think about the generation of Israelites that did not inherit the promised land, but they did leave Egypt right? They weren't spiritually strong enough to cross that Jordan and dwell in Canaan because they sinned against God in Kadesh Barnea. They got scared and wanted to go back in Egypt. But you know what? Their kids took over the promised land. That promised land would not have been conquered if they had all said, well, you know what? Having kids is kind of expensive. The economy is kind of tight. I'm not going to have any kids or I'll just have one and just not have any after that then there would not have been enough soldiers. There were, there were millions of Israelites when they took over the promised land, if you look at the book of Numbers. So your kids will go on to do the things you cannot. Think about this too. Your ki if you raise your kids godly, let's say you weren't raised Christian. Let's say you weren't raised in a godly home. You might have some sin in your life that has limited what you can do for God. For example, maybe you didn't know about the values of marriage and you got divorced. So you can never serve as a pastor if you're a man, right? Or let's say you had some pretty bad habits and you damaged your health so you can't travel as much. You can't speak as eloquently. Or let's say you have some pretty negative things in your past. You have some trauma that you need to work through. It'll take your whole life to work through it. But your kids growing up in a safe and sheltered environment from that stuff, they can do more for God because they don't have as much baggage. No matter what the situation is, because those Israelites who did not make it into the promised land, but they did make it out of Egypt. They knew Egypt was bad, but they didn't have a strong enough relationship with God to know that the promised land was better. And so they just sort of stayed, okay, I'm not in Egypt anymore, but I'm not going to do this for God. God, I'll get out of Egypt for you. God, I'll, I'll, I'll cut the, the weed out of my life. God, I'll cut the fornication out of my life. God, I'll cut the drinking out of my life. God, I'll cut this and that out of my life. But you know what, God? I'm not going to read my Bible. You know what, God? I'm not going to pray as much. You know what, God? I'm not going to sing songs in praise of you as much. There are people who they know enough about God to know what evil to avoid, but they don't have that drive in them to push more towards what's holy and what's righteous before God. But you know what? Their kids growing up under their care might, without having the extra baggage and temptations that their parents have learned to avoid, They'll be the ones that read their Bible cover to cover. They'll be the ones that pray to God on a daily basis. They'll be the ones that are a virgin when they walk down the aisle to their spouse. So just because you couldn't complete all of the work that you want to do for God doesn't mean your kids can't. And that's an importance of having children. They can continue the work for God that you could not finish. Just like David 
with, by him committing adultery with Bathsheba, by some of the sins in his life, he disqualified himself from having certain blessings that Solomon was able to enjoy. So the next gen the most important reason is the next generation is able to go on and speak with the enemies at the gate. Go on and do those great things for God that you did not get to do in your generation. How can that happen if you don't have any children? Now you, you might say, oh, well, the economy's tight. And I'll get to that. Because after we're done here in Psalms, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to look at that too. Now, but we're going to look at, we're going to stay here in Psalms. Look at the, look at the end of verse five of Psalm 127. They shall speak with the enemies at the gate. Now imagine the enemies in the gate. I'm sorry. Now imagine if they didn't have kids, then they wouldn't be able to speak with the enemy at the gate. The, the enemies would come in and win. And don't you know that is happening in Europe? In Europe, they are depopulated massively. The women are so feminist. I'm not saying all European women. If you're a European woman watching this sermon, just know I'm not necessarily talking about you. I am talking about the culture of your country in general. A lot, England, the UK, a lot of these, France especially, there's an anti-childbearing culture. Children are just a burden. If you're talking about women getting married and childbearing, what are you taking us back to the 20s? What do you want us to not vote? All this stuff. Listen, God has a created order. When you step out of that order, I don't care what your rationalization is, you will suffer consequences. Look at France, look at the UK. They are so feminist, they're not having children. The men are so backward, they're not taking on the responsibilities of being a husband and a father that England and France, they're depopulated. But guess what? That land isn't just sitting unused. You know why? Muslim immigrants from Arab countries are coming in and taking over. And you know, Islamic culture is very, you know, large families, a lot of it due to polygamy and rape and other things that are inappropriate that are part of Muslim culture. If you look up the life of Muhammad, the dude was a rapist and a pedophile. And so a lot of his adherents are just continuing his legacy. But the point is, hordes of Muslims taking over those countries, causing violence, attacking Christians, causing intimidation, and even London has a Muslim mayor now. And so they've totally terraformed that culture to where they have laws against speaking out against Islam. It's ridiculous. But that's what happens when the land is not filled with them. When the land is full of them, they're a threat to the enemy. If Christians would multiply physically and spiritually, you would not see those things start to happen. But guess what? It's already starting to happen here in the United States. Look at a place like Minneapolis, which it, it might as well be Syria or Afghanistan or something like that. So you need to understand that buffering society, bu your children are a buffer for society against a lot of that. Having strong Christian men standing at the gate, that's what God wants. But it takes a strong Christian lady to stay with her husband and have kids to be able to do that. We need more people in this fight. Let's continue. Look at Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, it shall be well with thee. So notice, eating the labor of thine hands. Sounds like you're able to provide. Sounds like you're not financially hurting for anything if you're eating the labor of your hands. You want more? Work harder. You want more? Gain some new skills so you can get a promotion. Let's continue. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Now, if you know anything about a vine, a vine doesn't just produce one fruit and then it stops. A grapevine produces a whole cluster of grapes. So imagine if you had a whole bunch of children. God is saying, if you have a bunch of children, you are blessed. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people twist this and they'll go and fornicate around. A man will have a bunch of children by a bunch of different women. A, man, a woman will have a bunch of kids by a bunch of different men. God is saying a bunch of children within the nuclear family, not just out with whoever. That's why it says, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. So that's, if you think about it, if you have a table and you have enough olives to line the entire perimeter of the table, that's a substantial amount of kids. It is a blessing to have a lot of kids. Oh, but what about the fact that there's not enough food on the plant to sustain them? Well, maybe if these corporations would stop polluting and use the land correctly or figure out new ways to grow the crops without ruining the water supply, that wouldn't be a problem. 
Or how about all the food that gets thrown away all the time because people are just wasting it? So let's continue here. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. So that's national security right there, right? Jerusalem being blessed. Let's continue. Yeah, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. National security, part of that is the population. Part of that is having enough strong warriors to protect it. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, the economy is bad. You know, it's not a good time to have kids because the economy is bad and the dollar doesn't stretch as far. Tell that to the Great Depression generation. The Great Depression generation, a dollar didn't stretch very far there. But guess what? They had plenty of children. I watched uh, several videos from a channel on YouTube. I'm not saying that I agree with this woman's doctrine. I believe she was Catholic and Catholicism is not a saving doctrine because Catholicism teaches you got to work for your salvation by going to the priest and all this stuff. When the Bible just says, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? So I don't agree with Catholicism. I don't endorse it, but I watched the, I can't remember what the name of her channel was. It was like Clara's Home Cooking or something like that. It was a video about a woman who lived through the Great Depression. Her name was Clara, and it shows all of these uh, poor man's meals that she learned to make. She grew up in the Great Depression. She said, it was cold, we didn't have a lot, we didn't have this, we didn't have that, but you know what she said? But we were happy. This is a little girl who grew up during the poorest time in our country, and she said, but we, are ha but we were happy. Why? Because they had family, they had each other. And if you're a Christian family, you can be even happier than that because as a Christian, you should have in the Holy, from the Holy Spirit the peace that passeth understanding in you. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29. This is a time when we saw that the economy was bad. We saw that, why? Because the Israelites had just been taken captive in the land of Judah. Look what it says there. Let's look at 20, Jeremiah 29, 4. This is for all of you MGTOWs out there, or for all of you, you want to be her fiance, but you're, you don't have the, how should I say this nicely? You don't have the spine, you don't have the backbone to step up and be her husband. You want to stay at fiance status. You don't have the boldness to become her husband because you're afraid that once kids come in the picture, you can't spend money going out partying as much as you used to, which you shouldn't be partying at all, but that's another discussion. Because the Bible says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. If it's a bunch of drinking and carrying on, that's not godly. But let's continue here. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. So God caused them to be captive. God let them go into slavery. Why? Because they rejected God's laws. They rejected God's word. Listen, America is the best place to live on this planet, but don't let that go to your head because just like the Israelites disobeyed God and God brought them down, if America keeps rejecting God, God can let us be captive. God can let us get taken out of this land and be forced to work in the Chinese sweatshops that have provided our clothes for decades. God can let us be forced to go work in Russia in a nuclear factory or, or they probably wouldn't trust us with that. But if God wanted to, he could peel away our national security and let us get captured just like he did. Because think about this. People don't think about this. The Israelites were God's chosen nation at the time, right? If God can let that happen to his chosen nation, what makes you think he wouldn't let it happen to you? But let's continue here. Look what he says to these people while they're in captivity. Because when you're in captivity, you're in the lowest economic standard. You're bottom rung. You're one of the captives. You know, he says in verse five, build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. Isn't this the same idea of the land being full of them in Exodus chapter 1? So he, he's talking to people who just got kicked out of their house and, and were forced to work in the Babylonian sweatshop. He's talking to people who just lost their lands everything that was theirs and they they have to start all over 
Because think about it. When you're an immigrant to a foreign country, even if you're a reluctant immigrant, like these Jews were carried away as slaves into Babylon or as captives, if you're starting over in a new country, you're at the bottom. You got to work your way up. And you know what God told them? He told them to work hard and have lots of babies. Let me be brutally honest with you. You have no right to complain about being a minority if the women in your culture are not doing what it takes to make yourself a majority someday. And if the men are not doing what it takes to make yourself a majority someday. The women marrying, bearing children and guiding the house and the men providing, stepping up, doing what it takes, leading, protecting, but most importantly, both the man and the woman spreading the spiritual message of Christianity. Oh, Christianity is on the decline. What have you done about it? Have you had some godly children? Have you convinced a sinner that Jesus is God and that they need to trust in him for their salvation? Have you done any of those things? Or do you just read the newspaper and then whenever someone wants to challenge you, you just fold up and get defensive? What have you done about it? If you complain about Christianity being in the decline, what have you done to make us a majority someday? Now, Let's, let's look deeper into Jeremiah 29 here. Oh, but the economy's bad. What do we do? Cook from scratch. If you have space, plant a garden so you can grow some of your food. Because look at verse 5. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. You're not always going to be able to save up money and buy whatever you want at the store. What if you have needs? Find other ways to meet your needs because planting, thats you're becoming more self-sufficient. Think about things in those terms. Think about financial independence. Think about self-sufficiency. Think about things not in terms of, oh, I'll take a loan for this and a credit card for that. That's enough trouble. Don't do that. Don't think in terms of debt. Think in terms of how do I save up? Because if you're planting gardens, that's hard work. I'm starting to grow a garden. It is very hard work. I mean, I'm trying to grow potatoes right now and I'm trying to grow them in a raised bed. I'm trying to grow some in the ground, seeing what works. And I have these stinking Colorado potato beetles that keep messing with my potatoes and I have to go out meticulously crushing them with my fingers. And get, it's hard work to garden. I'm out here in 90 plus degree weather, smashing bugs so my kids can have something to eat to come harvest time or so that we can supplement. So yes, have a lot of kids, but also learn some frugal tricks, learn some ways to stretch your dollar. The people in the Great Depression did it. The people that were captive in Babylon did it. The people that were captive in Egypt, all the way in the book of Exodus, if they can do it, why can't you? Humans have been finding a way to get along for centuries. Whether it's making broth out of the bones of the chicken once you're done eating it, there's all kinds of ways to survive. So this all, well, the economy's bad. That's not an excuse. Let's end this in 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is the final reason why the depopulation mentality is bad. This is not the primary reason. This reason is sort of a side effect. And that's this. Your children are your retirement plan. If you've earned it. A lot of people say, oh, well... I don't need kids. I can just save up my retirement money in a savings account. Well, what if inflation hits and your dollar's not worth as much? So what you thought was a few hundred thousand dollars is really just fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Dollars lose value around the globe all the time. Or they'll say, oh, well, I, I'll just, you know, who's going to help take care of you? It's supposed to be your children if you've earned it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 4 but if any widow have children or nephews let them first to show piety at home and to requite their parents i'm sorry let me reread that i missed a word there let me start over but if any widow have children or nephews let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite let me read that word again requite their parents for that is good and acceptable before God. What does it mean by requite their parents? Requite is when someone gives back to you what you have already given to them first. So in other words, parents, take good care of your kids today. Meet their needs. Be patient. Be loving. Be understanding. Because there's going to come a day where you're so old and you now need their help. And requite means you've sown into them. And then when the time comes, 
you reap from them. So I, I thought about this. This was kind of funny. This was a, several years ago. And actually, it was a few years ago. I was with my wife and our kid. We were pushing her in the stroller. We were, we were in the parking lot somewhere. And I told a joke that sort of made the people around me laugh. I said, think about this. When, they're a small, when our kids are a baby, we push them in a stroller. But if we get old enough, there's going to come a day where they push us in a wheelchair. And that sort of made everybody laugh. But just think about that for a second. Your children are part of your retirement plan. You sow into them. You meet their needs. You teach them good financial habits. You protect them from falling into debt. You sacrifice so that they can have what they need. So that when the day comes where you're too old and it's hard for you to lift up your groceries to bring them into your house after you've been out shopping or you need help because it's not as easy for you to get around, your kids can be there for you to take care of you. And if you have several kids, then each one can divide the burden of taking care of you so that you're not overly taxing one or two of them and requiring so much. You can just have a little from this kid, a little from that kid, because guess what? Social security is not guaranteed to be there or guaranteed to be worth as much. Your pension could be gone in a minute. Or you could have one of those jobs where they fire you so they don't have to give you a pension. There's no guarantees in life. The Bible tells us to not trust in uncertain riches. But you know what we can be sure of? If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto us. So to all you dads out there, all you Christian dads that are responsible, happy Father's Day. Love God and love your children. God bless you.